So this morning, what we're talking about, it's up on the board, consecration, a life set apart. And God's been dealing with me. Actually, as we were worshiping today, God gave me the next message um, because we're, we're, um, we're going to be talking about, you know, as we were worshiping, wow, I don't know about you, but God was just ministering to me in a big way. And I don't know if you felt his peace. I don't know if you felt, you know, the presence of God here, but I did. And um, I believe that God started showing me some things. Um, and and I'm, we're going to talk about that, just about our need, just about how desperate we are, are for him and how much we need God and what our lives might look like without him. And God showed me that, what was that, last week, last Sunday when we were worshiping? Oh, my goodness. God rocked my world last week. So I'm going to get to share that with you and hopefully rock your world. Yay. Amen. <laughs> Amen. So consecration, a life set apart. That's what we're talking about this morning. To consecrate means to make holy or to dedicate to a higher purpose. Did you hear that? To make holy or to dedicate to a higher purpose. Is there anyone listening to my voice right now who believes that they were created for a higher purpose? Amen. Those of you who raised their hand, that's awesome, and I want you to be excited about that and being running after that. Those who didn't and those who aren't sure, that's okay too, but I want to assure you that you were created for a higher purpose, that God knit you together in your mother's womb, and he knew every one of your days before one of them came to pass, and he has a plan and a purpose to bless you, to prosper you, and to use you for his kingdom. And so there is something greater than yourself that God has called you to, and we're going to talk a little bit about that today. People created for a higher purpose, don't live like everybody else lives. Did you hear me? Maybe we'll take a hand raise at the end and see if you're still raising your hand. There's a process that accompanies someone being consecrated for God and for His purposes. Let's go to Exodus chapter 19. Exodus chapter 19. I just took some, a few scripture scattered throughout the Word that talk about consecration or that mention consecration, there's a lot more backstory to these uh, Scripture than what I'm going to be sharing today, but I just want to kind of bring out some points as we're going through the Scripture. Feel free to go back and read the backstories and, and learn a little bit about what was happening during that time period. Exodus 19, verses 10 and 11 say this, And the Lord said to Moses, Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow. Have them wash their clothes and be ready by the third day, because on that day the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. Did you hear what's going on here? It says again, God speaking to Moses, and he's telling them, go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow. Have them wash their clothes and be ready by the third day. Have them consecrate themselves today and tomorrow. Have them consecrate themselves. Have them consecrate themselves today and tomorrow. Are you hearing that? Have them consecrate themselves. Have them wash their clothes and be ready by the third day because on that day the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. The Lord was ready to do something new among His people. And so in order to do something new, he instructed Moses to have the people consecrate themselves to prepare for an encounter with God. Amen. How many of you would like to have an encounter with God? And so those of us who are wanting to have an encounter with God, the message to us today is consecrate yourselves. Set yourselves apart. Remember that word, consecrate? Uh, when we talked about the definition, right? Here's what it says. To make holy or to dedicate to a higher purpose. Some definitions say to set, be set apart for a higher purpose. And so what we're talking about is if we want to have that encounter, if we want to go to that next level that God has prepared for us, that God has in store for us, it's time for us to consecrate ourselves as a people of God. He wants to do something new among us. He instructed Moses to lead the people in an act of consecration to prepare for what was about to happen. Consecration is done for preparation. Did you hear that? Consecration is done for preparation. Preparation to have an encounter with God. Preparation to go to that next place that God is calling you to go. Consecration happens for preparation. And so when you consecrate yourselves, you're preparing yourselves to meet with God 
and to hear what he has to say and to go to that next level with him. Notice who was doing the washing. Again, have them wash their clothes. They were the ones preparing themselves. Do you want to have an encounter with God? Do you want to meet with him? Consecrate yourselves in preparation for this encounter. Go to Revelation chapter 19. We've talked about the radiant church. We've talked about Ephesians chapter 5 and how Jesus loves the church. We're going to go to that. We're going to read that whole chapter in a minute. But the church is also the bride of Christ. Have you ever heard that term? In Revelation, in verse 7 here, it says, Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. Amen? For the wedding of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. Her bride, his bride has made herself ready. Amen? So there's a feast that's coming. Amen? There's a wedding feast. There's a festival that's coming. For the church and for Jesus Christ, we are his bride, and he's calling us to himself, right? And it says here that the bride has made herself ready. We cannot continue to involve ourselves with unclean things and hope to be received from God. It says here, you and I are the bride of Christ, and it's time that we make ourselves ready. It's time that we stepped away from the crowd mentality and a need to act like everybody else. It's time that we stepped away from the crowd mentality and a need to act like and look like everybody else around us. This is something that many churches don't want to preach because they don't want to offend people. But the reason why the church is in the state that the church is in, and because the church is, as a whole is weak, I mean, if you have a church on every corner, come on now, if you have a church on every corner, there shouldn't be only one-fourth of the people, the population in this area. One-fourth go to church. One-fourth. Church on every corner. One-fourth go to church. Come on now. That's because people are saying, there's nothing in there that I need. And in many churches, you go into the church and there's nothing in there that you need. We need to be a church that when people come, they receive what they need in their time of health. They they receive what they need. And what they need sometimes isn't always what they think they need. We need to be the church. We need to come out from them. That's what 2 Corinthians 6, 17 says. In verse 17 it says, Therefore, come out from them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing and I will receive you. Touch no unclean thing and I will receive you. Touch no unclean thing and I will receive you. People are wondering why God's not moving in their lives. They're looking at other people and saying, Oh God, why are you doing that? Touch no unclean thing, and I will receive you. Again, we cannot continue to involve ourselves with unclean things and hope to be received by God. He is a holy God. I said He's a holy God. Now here we talk about a God of love. We talk about a God that rescues us. We talk about a God that runs after us. We talk about a God who helps us, and He is all that and more. But he's holy. He's holy. And the scripture tells us in 1 Peter 1, 15 to 17, but just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. Is holy perfect? Is it talking about you have to be perfect? No. No. It's talking about an attitude. It's talking about a mindset. It's talking about a lifestyle. And though a righteous man falls seven times, he gets up again. He, wait, whoa, whoa, you're blowing my mind. A righteous man, if he falls seven times, how can he be righteous? Because it's about direction, not always about perfection. It's about direction. A righteous man is going to go in the same direction over and over and over and over and over again. A righteous woman is going to travel in the same direction. What direction is that? It's the direction towards God's throne. He's going towards God's throne. She's going towards God's throne. And when she gets tripped up, when he gets tripped up, when they make a mistake, they get up and they keep going. Though a righteous man falls seven times, he rises again. 
be ye holy as I am holy. And that's the direction we're heading. Are we there yet? No. Has anybody arrived yet? No. But are we keeping in that direction? Yeah. Yeah. We're going after God because that's the direction he's called us as Christians. Go to Ephesians chapter 5. Normally, we skip right to the we skip right to the part that talks about the glorious church, the radiant church, and I love it. And that's why we go to that all the time because this church, that's what we're after. We're going after God, and we want to be the radiant church that God has called us to be, the, the radiant church that Jesus had a passion for, the radiant church that it says that he gave up everything for. That's what we want to be at Transformation Church. But you got to read the whole chapter. And here it is. Verse 1, follow God's example. Sounds like be ye holy as I am holy. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love. Just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. So what does Ephesians chapter 5 start out with? It starts out with love. It starts out with the love of God. Because everything we do, all of our motivation has to be by love. If you're motivated by anything than God's love, then you need to check your motivations. So we start out with God's love because that's where we always have to start out. Verse 3, but among you there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality or any kind of impurity or of greed because these are improper for God's holy people. Okay, let me, just, let me just take a second here. Please don't be surprised when the world acts like the world. Because this says about God's people. And so if worldly people show up to do something worldly, you shouldn't ought to be surprised about it. Because they don't know better. They're living in darkness. And we need to go back to chat, the, the, the verse 1 and 2. Love. God's love. You know, when I look in the Scripture, I find out that Jesus interacted differently depending on who you were. And I find out if I study Scripture that Jesus was very kind and compassionate and loving towards sinners. And I found out that when it came to religious people, he had some righteous indignation in him. He flipped over some tables. He spoke harshly to the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He spoke harshly to them. Because why? All of that was love. Do you understand what I'm saying? It was love to the sinners because they needed to see God's love in that way in order for them to be changed, right? Because repentance comes through the goodness of God. But to those people that were religious and were stern and thought they knew everything, they needed a word of rebuke and of correction. And that was God's love because if they didn't get that and if they didn't embrace that and if it didn't change something in their lives, then they were in trouble. And so when you see Jesus interacting differently with different people, it doesn't mean he was a different person to different people. No, he was the same person, but he knew what every single person needed. And we need to be careful that we don't mix those up and start going and, and, and trying to attack people that are living in sin because we're threatened by that. Even if they come to your town and film a movie that you don't like. Let's get out the petitions. Let's start saying, let's go down and pick it. Well, did God tell you to do it? If God told you to do it, go for it. It'll bear fruit. But I'll tell you what, when they went down and they prayer walked and they prayed for that man who was directing that movie and tears came streaming down his cheeks, that was more than any picket sign is going to do. And so know who you're dealing with and hear the voice of God and then act. So none of this stuff should be spoken of among the people of God. They're improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be obscenity, 
foolish talk or coarse joking. Obscenity. That's swear words and all that kind of stuff. How y'all doing? God's, pe- God's people are here, right? Foolish talk. Do we talk foolish sometimes? Our words are powerful. You are stewards of the words that God has given you. Coarse joking. Sometimes our sense of humor is need redeemed. Amen. Sometimes, I mean, if you think that, if you're a child of God and you think that the things of this world, that you're laughing along with the world at different things, you might want to check. You might want to check. I'm just saying, this is a good checklist here to go down. They're out of place. And then it goes on to say, but rather thanksgiving. For of this you can be sure, no immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a person is an idolater. These people have no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore, do not be partners with them. Sometimes I think I should just come read and just sit down. Because to me, it sounds pretty obvious here what God's saying. Verse 8, for you were once, you were once darkness. You See how that says that? You were once darkness. It doesn't say you were once sitting in darkness. You were once in darkness. You were once darkness. You were darkness. <clears throat> but now you are light in the Lord. You were darkness. Now you're light in the Lord. Live as children of light. Live as children of light. When you walk out these doors, live as children of light. Represent heaven well. For the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. It is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible, and everything that is illuminated becomes a light. This is why it is said, Wake up, sleeper! Rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Verse 15, Be be very careful then how you live, not as unwise but as wise, making the most of every moment because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. There it is, man. There's instructions on how to live your life as a Christian. We all need to go back and study this and read it over and over and over again until it gets down on the inside of us. Do you have any question about what God is calling you to? Do you have any question about His expectations on your life? If you have any questions, go back and read because all the answers are there. For those who are interested in finding out what the answers are, Now, if you want to live your own life and have a designer God, don't read this. If you want to have your own designer God, don't read this because it's going to mess that all up. You can't live your life any old way you want and call yourself Christian. There are many people that do. They're deceived. We need to walk in the light as He is in the light. Verse 21, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. 22, wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives 
should submit to their husbands in everything. You see, there's a partnership there between a husband and a wife. There's a partnership. You should be seeking after God together. You should be going after God together, right? And that's not always the case. That's not always how it happens, but that's how God's design is, and that's how it should happen. And, the, and, and there's, a, there's, a, there's a way that God tells us that we ought to live in our married lives. And some people might not like it, but it doesn't make it any lo, un, less, untru, less true. It's true, whether you like it or not. Now, some people take it and abuse it and twist it and make it sound like something that it's not. There are abusive husbands that go out and try to control everything that their wife does and everything that their family does. That's controlling. That's not what this is talking about. We are partners together seeking after God. And when you're in the right mind with God, if you both have the mind of Christ, then you're both going to be going in the same direction. But this is not untrue. This is true. And anybody that's afraid of it, you're in error. You have some kind of stronghold, some kind of maybe something from the past that's keeping you from experiencing the peace and the joy and the provision that God has in this thing. You need to get rid of that. You need to go after God and get free. It's supposed to be a beautiful thing. Listen to that. Just like the church submits to Jesus as the head, right? That's what it's talking about. That's a beautiful thing. I love to submit to Jesus. I love to, to hear what he's telling me to do and, and to do it. That's part of the scripture. 25, husbands, love your wives. Don't beat them. Don't control them. Don't misuse them. Don't degrade them. Love them. Husbands, love your wives. Just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Jesus loved the church and gave himself up for her. Husbands, give yourself up for your wives. Give yourself up. Honor them. Prefer them above yourself. Jesus gave himself. Like, look, listen to this. Get this. Get something. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any such blemish, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. You see, it's saying that just as Christ, by the washing of the water of the word, right, he sanctified the church, he made her clean and holy, right? He, 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 so he was doing what he could to bless her and to cause her to be radiant. What can you do to bless your wife and to cause her to be radiant? without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body, just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh." This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you must also, each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Mm. And so we read all the time about this radiant church, but we very rarely talk about what comes before it or what co comes after it. But all of this is necessary in order to be the radiant church. So what kind of lives ought we to live if this is what we've been called to as a body of believers? Did you hear the instructions given at the beginning of this chapter on how we're supposed to live our lives? It told us everything that we should not be involved in as believers. These are the unclean things that we've been called not to touch as believers. There are a lot of believers touching unclean things. 
when we consecrate our lives for his purposes, we set these things aside and we run after Jesus. Why? Did you notice how the list of how we should live our lives preceded Christ's vision for the church? That's why. Why? Because Christ has a passion for a glorious, victorious church. And you and I are that church. You and I are that church. It's not some, it's not some idea that we can't wrap our minds around. It's not some, you know, it, it's you. It's you. And as we come together, it's us. We are that glorious church without spot or wrinkle or blemish or any such. That's what God's called us to. And then he told us how in the first part of Ephesians. And then the last part of Ephesians. All of this is important for us to walk in what God's called us to. The washing of the water of the word consecrates us. The washing of the water of the word rids us of all distractions and sets us apart for God's plans and purposes. The washing of the water of the word cleanses us from unclean things and turns us in to that radiant church. Come on now, the the washing of the water. You see, Jesus said he saw that there was something that wasn't 100%. So there was the washing of the water of the word, the washing of the water of God's word, the washing of the water of his word. And it caused her to become the radiant church. She wasn't radiant, but the washing of the water of the word turned her into the radiant church. And the washing of the water of God's word will turn us into the radiant church. But it's not the washing of the water of the word that you get on Sundays only. If you're not getting washed by the word daily, Jesus washed the feet. He had to wash the feet. Why? Because when you go through life, the dirt of this world sticks to you as you're walking through life. And so that needs washed off. Every day it needs washed off. Get into that word and get something from God's word that you can take through that day to keep you alive, to keep you healthy, to keep you strong, to keep you focused on what God's called you to so that you don't get distracted into the things of this world. You're in the world, but you're not to be of the world. And so if you're in the world, you need something to keep you focused on what God's called you to. And right in the middle of being in the world, you are radiant. And people are drawn to you. Why? Because you're different than the rest of the world. That's what you're called to as a Christian. You're called to be different, 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 different. Quit trying to be the same. Quit trying to be the same as the world around you. And dare to be different. Dare to be different. Dare to be different. And God is going to start drawing people to you when you're different. When you're the same, they don't need to be drawn to you because there's nothing about you that's any different than the rest of the world. But when you're different... They see it. They see something shining from your life. And they say, they have something that I need. This is Christianity. It's Christianity. It's Christianity. There's not one type of Christianity and another type of Christianity. This is Christianity. God is on the move. He is on the move. There's all kinds of other verses. Let me just read them real quick. Joshua 3, 5. Joshua told the people, consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. Consecrate yourselves, for for the Lord wants to do, he wants to do, he's crying out to do amazing things among you. Consecrate yourselves, consecrate yourselves, consecrate yourselves, because God is desiring to do amazing things among you. So God was about to do amazing things among his people. He instructed Joshua to prepare the people for what he was about to do. Consecration always precedes a new work of grace in your life. I said consecration will always precede a new work of grace in your life. If you're ready to go to that next level, then get away with God. Spend more time with God. Get your eyes focused on God and let him take you to that next level. Consecration precedes a new work of grace in your life. If you want to experience that new work of grace in your life, God's just waiting to give it to you. And all you got to do is set yourself apart and begin to seek after him and ask him to show up big and to take you to the next place that he has prepared for you because that's what he desires to do. Isaiah, man, he found this out, right? Isaiah 6, 1 through 8. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, and with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying, and they were calling out to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of His glory. 
at the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Verse 5, get this. Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. You see, this is the fear of the Lord. When we see Him as He really is, we will have a right perspective of Him. We will have a reverent fear of God. It is a scary thing to treat God as if He were your homie, your bud, or your bestie. Come on now. If you're thinking like that, that's stinking thinking. Get rid of it. He's not your homie, your bud, your bestie. He's not. He's holy, holy, holy. God is holy. And that's how we should approach Him. God is holy. We talk about the loving Father. We talk about all the great things. And He is all those things. But He's holy. Don't treat as familiar something that's sacred. He is the mighty and terrible one against his enemies. He is revered and feared among all those who have encountered him. We need a healthy balance between the all-powerful, mighty God of the entire universe and our loving Heavenly Father. He is both, but God is no joke. God is no joke, and he won't be mocked. And whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. Come on, hear me now. That which he sows, he will also reap. If you sow to your flesh, you will reap destruction. But if you sow to the Spirit, you'll reap everlasting life. That's the truth of God's Word. You can fool some of the people some of the time, but you never fool God. He is holy. He's not to be taken lightly. His commandments are not optional. Do not be deceived. Isaiah saw God as He really was. And he said, woe to me, I am ruined, I'm wrecked, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Going down to verse 6, then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, when he had taken with tongs from the altar, with it he touched my mouth, and he said, see, this has touched your lips, your guilt is taken away, and your sin is atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here I am, send me. Did you see that? Did you see that? First, God was revealed to him as God really was. And then there was a humility that came. He was wrecked, man. He realized what he was like. He realized what his life was really like. He realized what God was and what he was. And he realized that those were two different, very different things. And he fell on his face. He humbled himself. Woe to me. I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell among a people of unclean lips. Woe to me. This is a holy prophet of God. That's who he was. Yet he said, woe to me. No matter who's in this place right now, you need to see God as he really is. No matter how awesome you think you're doing, you need to see God as he really is. And all that will change. And you'll fall on your face in reverence to God, crying out, God, forgive me. And then what happens when you yell, God, forgive me? It says that they came and they touched his lips with that hot coal. And it said that everything changed. His guilt was gone. He was cleansed right in that moment. He was cleansed in that moment. And then what happened? He heard a voice. Who are we going to send? And he rose up and he said, here I am, Lord, send me. Do you see there's an order there? There's an order that took place there. We all want to be used greatly by God. But we haven't gone through the process to be used by God. Now, I believe that everybody can be used by God right where you're at in certain ways. But there are greater ways that God wants to use you. And as you go after him, God will do greater works in your life as you're pressing into him. This encounter was necessary for Isaiah to go to the next level in his relationship with God. I tell you, there is a consecration that must take place in order for us to be disciples of Jesus Christ. Are you taking your calling serious? Are you living your life for him? Because that's what he's calling us to. I'm going to end right here. Maybe we got a part two here somewhere. If I could have the worship team come up.
We're going to talk more about this. I got about halfway through. We're talking about this thing, consecration, and what it means to consecrate ourselves to God. And it means that we are set apart for God's plans and purposes. I surrendered my life to Jesus Christ in 1993. I had my Isaiah moment where I realized, man, he, the drill sergeant, he was senior drill sergeant, he was preaching. It's a long story if you want to know it, I can tell it to you, but some of you already heard it. The senior drill sergeant preaching and he, and he used Revelation chapter 3. And he said, I'd rather you either be hot or cold. God said to the church, people in the church, God said to people in the church, I'd rather you either be hot or cold, but because you're lukewarm, I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. I have to spew you out of my mouth. And that, bam, it hit me right between the eyes. I had, I had been a casual Christian for a long time. I mean, I had, like, drifted in and out of church. I wasn't a Christian. I didn't know the first thing about being a Christian. But I knew about spending an hour in a church every once in a while. Yeah, I could do that. I knew about that, but I didn't know about being a Christian. And when he shared that, revelation came. My eyes were open, and I saw that I was desperate for God. I was desperate for God. And that drew me to the front of that room on that morning in April of 1993. It drew me to the front of that room, and I gave my life to Jesus Christ. And my life has never been the same again. I realized that I was a sinner and that I needed God's forgiveness. So maybe you're listening to me today, either in this room or by online, and you're hearing what I'm talking about, and maybe you're in that place. Maybe you're realizing that your life needs to change. And I want you to know this morning that when I prayed that prayer and I asked Jesus Christ to come into my life and be my Lord and Savior, that he was faithful. I mean, I could share with you stories of how he intervened in my life after that prayer was prayed to bring me into the positions and to the people that I needed to go to in order to get on the journey that he had prepared for my life. I had to meet certain people. I had to be in certain places for that to happen. And that happened supernaturally. Like, it was crazy, the things that God did to bring people across my path. I mean, my sister was praying for me for two years. She had gotten saved before I was. She prayed for me for two years. And God took me to Oklahoma to get saved because I couldn't get saved. Yeah. I couldn't get saved by religion. I had to go someplace to get saved by Jesus. And so he sent me to Oklahoma. And I prayed that prayer. My life has never been the same again. Why? Because I surrendered. I surrendered my life. And that's where consecration begins. Consecration begins at surrender. And so if there's anybody here this morning and you've never taken that step and you've never fully surrendered your life or maybe you've taken it at one time and you've walked away from it, and you want to come back. I want you to pray this prayer with me right now. And it's a simple prayer that's just asking Jesus Christ to come into your life and be your Lord and Savior, to wash away all your sins and to make you clean and to empower you to live a life for Him. If that's a prayer that you want to pray with me right now, then let's close our eyes, bow our heads, search our hearts. And for those that desire to pray this prayer, I want you to repeat this prayer after me right now. Say, Lord Jesus, I need help. My life doesn't look like what your Bible says. Right now, I ask you to forgive me of all my sins. And I ask you to come into my life and be my Lord and Savior. God, I surrender. And I pray that you would empower me to live my life completely for you. In Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, God did just that. Right now, I want everybody else to stand to your feet. And I want to pray a prayer over you. 
Now, everybody stands to your feet, but as you listen to this message, there were certain people that this message might have touched base with. And if this message touched base with you, I just want you to lift up your hand right where you're at at your seat. And I'm not even looking at whose hands are up. I don't care. This is for God to see. And I want you to simply pray a prayer with me. Say, Lord Jesus, I want more. I want my life to be lived for you. I want my life to be set apart for your plans and purposes and your plans alone. Right now, I ask you to strip me of everything that's not of you. And I pray that you would fill me with everything that is of you. God, I pray that any wrong relationships that I'm in right now, you would sever and you would separate me from anybody that's a bad influence in my life. Right now, I ask you to help me to guard my mind, to guard my heart with all my might. Right now, I pray that you would convict me of any shows that I'm watching, of anything I'm looking at online, of any wrong conversations that I'm having, and anything else that's not pleasing to you. Wash it away. Take it now. Make me pure and take me to the next level that you have for me. In Jesus' name. Amen. Father, I pray for your people. I bless your people in the name of the Lord. God, I pray for your holiness to come upon them. I pray, Father God, that as they go through the week, you would go through the week with them. I pray that our eyes would be open to truth, and I pray that you would lead us and guide us in the way that we should go, and I pray that you would completely transform our lives, and I pray that you would take us to that next place that you have prepared for each one of us. I pray that you would turn us into the radiant church that you have a passion for. God, make us into the people that you desire for us to be, for your glory and for your honor and for your praise, and draw people to us as they see your light shining from us. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Have an awesome week.